Hi, I'm Shoestring Jane. Welcome back to my channel where I talk about all things thrifty, frugal and money saving. And today I've just been thinking about more reasons to be frugal, really, and why there are so many and lots of us could benefit from just developing a few more frugal habits. And it kind of stems from conversations I've had with my three daughters who are all 20s, early 30s and you know, struggling really. I, th I think that they struggle more than I did at the same age because it's a different climate really. So I think that embracing a frugal lifestyle can be so helpful, as I say, for most of us. And, and there are lots and lots of good reasons to be frugal. So I thought I'd just have a little chat around that. My own experience of having to pay a mortgage, whilst bringing up three teenagers, then teenage daughters, who, if you've got teenagers, you know how demanding they can be and what a strain and a drain that can be on your finances, really. So I wasn't on a particularly high income. So doing that on a lowish income, whilst paying all the bills and trying not to get into debt, was a challenge and I think I'd find it even harder now that we're in a cost of living crisis to be perfectly honest with you although you know there's these things have come and gone really throughout my adult life I've kind of been aware of different financial problems that are kind of beyond my control that but that nevertheless impact on me so I think it just controlling the bits you can control is a good starting point and trying to manage your finances well as well as you can and as I say I think like frugal living is kind of a, a key kind of foundation for that really. In order to kind of adopt this frugal lifestyle I began to question every single purchase. Do I really want this? Do I really need this? Why am I buying this? Can I do without this? Have I got something that would do just as well, you know, can, you know, is, can I borrow it? There are all different ways of doing it rather than just thinking, I need that, I want it, I'm going to have it, and then worrying about the cost later. So that was kind of a, a first point. And uh, when I did buy, I shopped around and I bought almost exclusively secondhand. I love buying secondhand. Once you get into doing that, you realise how much more you get for your money and you resent when you have to buy new. Although, you know, sometimes you do, you do have to buy new, but a lot of the time, you can avoid it, I feel. So I planned all of our meals. I didn't waste any food. I yeah, made sure that we incorporated anything that we already had in the fridge into the meal plan for the week before I went to buy more groceries. And I shopped with a list, basic stuff. And, you know, we stopped having so many takeaways. We hardly had any takeaways, actually, because it's just, you know, when you buy a takeaway, five people in the house, it can cost you, you know, as much as, your shopping budget for the week it's or you know half of it at least so depends what your shopping budget is for the week doesn't it I started buying exclusively from from Lidl and Aldi as soon as they arrived in the UK really because I realized just how much cheaper they are and at times I also do buy fruit and veg from the market they have improved we've got a better market here now but for a while that they it just wasn't very good so that wasn't really ideal for me if you've got a really good market in your town then you're really really lucky and use it because you can usually get a lot of good fresh produce at a fraction of the supermarket price plus with less packaging as well if you're environmentally aware and conscious of all of the plastic that you bring into your home so I made everybody wear layers you know layer up rather than just immediately going we're cold put the put the heating on just layer up first you know when it gets really cold we'll put the heating on and only heat as much hot water as we need so I'd have it for the morning and then after that rather than just have it come on for two hours in the evening which I used to do I would just say well let's put it on for an hour before you have a bath or I'd do it an hour's worth so because one of them would want a bath or a shower hours worth the next person needs to put the hot water on first because I'm not heating water that we don't use it just goes cold again waste of money and I kind of encourage them not to constantly change their clothes because I don't know it's about maybe it's a girl thing I don't know I don't know I only had three girls so I only have experience of girls but they would try outfits on decide that after half an hour that wasn't the right outfit take it off leave it all screwed up on the bedroom floor or the bed um 
where it would inevitably end up back in the laundry basket, you know, and I'd see things I think, hang on, you've had those on for three minutes. And I would take them out, put them back in their cupboards and the wardrobe, trying to encourage them not to just keep shoving stuff in the laundry. So that we had to do constant loads of laundry and also not to just decide they've got one top that they wanted to wear the next day. So they'll just put that top in the washing machine and say, no, you know, we have to have a full load. You wait for a full load, you wear a different top, hand wash that top and dry it. So things like that used to happen a lot. Um, I'd be constantly nagging them to turn lights off and we didn't have a tumble dryer. So I just decided early on in my life that I wasn't going to bother with tumble dryers. Uh, I think I had one once that somebody gave me. I got a second hand. It was rubbish and wasn't very good and it cost a lot to run. So I just didn't bother after that. So we had errors around the house and I know that can be a real pain if you have a lot of laundry. Another reason to minimise the amount of laundry that you have. So um, they can be a pain, but heated errors can be, you know, speed things up. We would put things over the radiators well, as well just to dry them more quickly. So we didn't have a tumble dryer. It was very expensive. As soon as the weather was good enough, everything would be out on the line. And I much prefer line dried clothes. So I think that's better. That suits us better. Any cars that we've bought, I've always bought secondhand cars. They've tended to be kind of runarounds, old bangers. I, I think somebody told me years ago, you know, you buy a new car and as you drive it off the forecourt, it's losing thousands and thousands of pounds. And I decided then I would never buy a new car. I haven't ever been in a job where they provided me with a new company car. So I've never had one for that reason, never had a new car. And I've always found that if, you know, if you buy a decent runaround, they've lasted me years and years and years. And I've been able to buy them for cash for a few thousand pounds. So that's what I've done. And it's been kind of successful for me. And I know that, you know, you can be unlucky with secondhand cars. I think I've been quite lucky and I've never had to take out a car loan or do a leasehold or anything like that. So I do think, though, if you're on a low income and you've got all these bills that even if you're frugal, it could be really hard to put money into savings. And if you, you know, if you don't earn much, but I did try to prioritise once I got control of my finances, at least having a decent emergency savings pot because that will save you money in the long run. Because if you have to, I don't know, perhaps your oven dies and you can't live without an oven. So you have to buy one on your credit card, maybe, or you have to buy one on the never, never. And, you know, that ends up costing you a lot more. So poor people end up paying more for anything like that or poorer people or people that have to buy on tick on credit because you've got to obviously pay somebody interest. So having an emergency fund would mean I wouldn't have to do that. So that was my priority as far as saving went. And I also made sure that I saved money for things that I knew were going to happen. So I'd have a car fund. I knew that it was going to be an MOT. I knew that the chances were that my car wouldn't get through the MOT or would have to do something because I drive old bangers. Um, I would say for Christmas and birthdays, I would say for holidays. And we always did try to have a holiday, although it would be quite a cheap holiday. So we'd look at camping or sometimes we'd look at house swapping. We did that at four occasions, I think, or five occasions, maybe. That kind of thing to try and keep the holiday costs low. So we wouldn't be deprived, but we wouldn't go crazy. So we wouldn't be spending lots and lots of money on a holiday and then spending the whole year paying that off and yearning for the next holiday, which didn't seem to make any sense to me. But that was all a few years ago now. As I say, it's been a few years since my daughters have lived with us and things are worse for them. It's much harder for them now. You hear people say they call millennials and Gen Zs and Gen Xs and whatever they're called. Um, they call them snowflakes. And I think that's just totally unfair. They, they People say things like, you know, if they didn't spend so much on takeout coffee and Deliveroo, they would have more money. But the reason that, that some people do decide to spend on those things rather than saving money for a house is because it seems so absolutely out of their reach. And they, they, they think, well, why start? I mean, I've had these conversations with my own daughter. So, it's just, we're never going to be able to do that. It's too difficult. We can't do it. So we may as well enjoy ourselves. And I can totally understand that point of view. But I think when you get to the point where, you know, maybe you're earning a little bit more and it is feasible, if you have been saving even just the smallest amount, like my youngest daughter can't afford to save very much at the moment. I think she's putting something like £20 into her 
lifetime ISA. Well, you know, £20 is better than nothing. And at certain points, you will be able to afford more. And I think that's a really sensible way of, of looking at it. Just thinking, well, OK, just say, I say just to them, just have it as a goal. Have it as a goal. Save some money because you will thank yourself in the future if you've done that. So I try and encourage them to. But it is difficult. I mean, my first house I bought with my ex-husband in the 1980s, the late 1980s, it cost us £40,000. So I looked, before I came to do this video, I had a look to see if I could find a house in the same road in Norwich, and I did. And that same very, very similar property now would cost at least £250,000. And OK, it's several decades on, but, ha but wages have not gone up proportionately so it's much much harder and you know interest rates may have been high then but 12 13 percent I think it was interest on 40,000 is a lot less actually than five or six percent interest or whatever it is now on 250,000 isn't it so you know it does, it's not you can't compare and you can't say that it's just because they don't manage their money properly. It just is not the case. It's much, much harder for them. So unless you've got family who can help you out with big chunks of money, buying a property is hard, especially if you're paying rent as well. I mean, a one bedroom flat here, a tiny one bedroom flat will cost you £850 probably a month in North Essex where I am. And a lot more the closer you get to London. So you end up with paying that for a tiny shoebox if you're lucky or garage or something in the closer you get to London. So, you know, it's just, it is hard. It is harder for people nowadays. But having said, said all that, there are ways to be frugal and there are good motivations to live more frugally and try and give yourself the best possible chance of perhaps getting your own property. I try to motivate my daughters by asking them a few questions. I'm not a financial advisor. You know, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not giving financial advice, but there are a few things that I have worked out during my life. And these are the things I ask my daughters in order to try and motivate them to get on top of their money and stay on top of their money. So I try to encourage my daughters to look ahead rather than just getting by day by day, really. And I ask them if they really want to be paying really high rents to faceless landlords who don't know them and don't owe them anything when they're in their 50s and 60s. Do they want to have no security? I mean, I rented for a year after I got divorced. And during that time, my landlord asked me if they could come and fit a downstairs toilet. And which made me suspicious, you know, I was thinking, well, well you're not doing that for my benefit. You're not paying out to fit a downstairs toilet for my benefit. So I asked lots of questions of the agent and it turned out that actually they were thinking of moving into the property themselves in the next year or so because they wanted to get their kids into a specific school and it was in the catchment area. And I said, well, no, no, if they want to do that, they can do that at their own convenience and they can, as it were, they can live here and have the inconvenience of having workmen in creating a downstairs toilet rather than making me do that whilst paying them rent and also making me feel very insecure because it was clear that they were not going to renew my tenancy. So actually, when we got to that, they did want to renew my tenancy because they thought I was a good tenant and they decided they didn't want to do that after all. But it had made me really nervous. And that's the point where me and Justin were saying, let's try and buy, let's try and buy something. So that's we were able to do that, luckily, but mainly because Justin had savings, not because I did. So I was really lucky to to be in that position. But I say to the girls, you know, do you want to be in that situation? Because you don't get in this country really long tenancies unless you are social housing. Um, most tenancies are a year um, and that gives you really, I mean, OK, most landlords are there for the long term and they want, they, they're happy to keep renewing if you're a good tenant but you don't have control over whether they decide to put the rents up I mean my eldest daughter moved out of her last property because they decided to put the rent up two years in a row and it would have been in the end after over two years it was going up over a hundred pounds a month so she found a slightly cheaper rent to pay a slightly cheaper flat but as I say it's a tiny 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 little flat she lives in so 
you know, you don't, it's not great being a tenant. I mean, some people will disagree with me and say, well, I've got a fabulous landlord and they don't overcharge. But I would say you're really lucky if you're in that situation. And a lot of people, just from my own experience and my daughter's experience of all being tenants and renters, it's it's not particularly good. It doesn't make you feel very secure and you don't have any control over what you're going to be paying going long term. So I, I say try, try and encourage them to try to buy their own places, even if that meant moving further up into the north of England to buy something or buying with somebody, you know, buying together. Maybe they could buy together or staying where they are and earning sort of London wages, but maybe buying and renting out uh, further out. So not being a horrible landlord, being a nice landlord. So that, you know, there's other options. I'm just encouraging them to think this way. Or I say, you know, would you like to have a choice about how long you work? You know, at the moment, we're not going to get our pensions until, well, I get mine at 67 because I'm a generation down. But, you know, most people will be 68. And for some people in the future, maybe it'll be 70. You know, how long are most of us going to live beyond 70? You know, do you want to keep doing that daily grind into your late 60s? And early 70s. I mean, when you're younger, you can't even begin to realise the kind of ailments you get. And now that I've hit 61, I'm getting a few aches and pains and arthritis and a few odd health problems. And I find I get very fatigued. You know, I just, I do not work full time hours now. I, I am in a position, luckily for me, where I, I don't have to. I work for myself. So I set my own hours. But, you know, would they like to do that? Perhaps they could be in a position when they can do that because they've had a mortgage, they've paid off their mortgage, they haven't got too big a mortgage in the first place. It's, I would say that's a, a thing not to do. Or what if they want to have children at some point and have some time off, you know, do, if they were in control of their own finances, then that gives them more options, even if they are, we're not talking necessarily mortgage, but if they can afford to pay the rent and earn a bit less because they have a frugal lifestyle. Or maybe, you know, they're in a job that they hate. I've been in jobs that I've absolutely detested, but I haven't been able to move out because I couldn't find, I couldn't afford to earn less. So if you can be really frugal and keep your finances under control, it's possible that it gives you those options to work a bit less, maybe earn a bit less, those kind of things. I know that's maybe less feasible right at the moment with the cost of living crisis. But, you know, just, just something to bear in mind, really. And I I'd say I tell them to save even a tiny amount, save every month. And I think that getting a lifetime ISA is a complete no brainer because if you're a young person, the government will top up 25% what for whatever you save. So take it, take it. And always pay into your work pension, always pay into your work pension. Your employer is obliged to top up what you put in. It's varying amounts. So I'm saying I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not going to start going into the details, but you, it's, it's extra money and you've got regular savings towards your retirement and your own financial security into the future. And your employer has to top that up as well. So, and it may be that at some point you're earning a bit more and you've got all those things in hand. And then perhaps you can start to have a look at other potential investments. So you can be quite cautious about that and go with a provider like, I don't know, Moneybox. I think it's one that my daughter uses. You can have a look at stocks and shares, ISAs and that kind of thing. But, you know, obviously look into it. Take some advice if you need to. Being frugal, living frugally, spending as little as possible, not having debts will help you to do that. So that is really important as well trying to avoid debt where you can. Um, it's really easy to kind of think, oh, that's OK. I've got a good job. I can afford to buy a new kitchen or get a new bathroom fitted or whatever, buy a new car because you can afford it now. But think, looking ahead, how long is that going to take you to pay off? What might happen in that time? Do you really want a lot of debt? Can you do it more cheaply? Could you just replace the kitchen cover doors to make it look better and do some painting or something like that. I mean, I'm just, there are various things you can do. You know, you, I would say, can you save up to do it rather than take out debt to do it? Sometimes that's not feasible, but if you can, it's something, you know, to consider. Like having lots of debt just causes so much stress. You pay so much interest. And if you can avoid a lot of debt, it will save you a lot of pain going forward. So all of these things, avoiding debt and 
building up savings and getting yourself into the best financial position possible, overpaying your mortgage maybe. All of those things are more possible when you live frugally. So lots and lots of reasons to start being a little bit more frugal there. And I don't mean by frugal living, I don't mean deprive yourself of everything. I mean, just prioritise your spending. Really consider what you're spending on. Don't just blindly spend. Be more mindful about your spending. And sometimes that does mean saying no to yourself, but it doesn't mean saying no to everything. And it may be that you actually get some benefits from thinking, well, I don't have to, you know, a good time is not just going up the pub, going to, for a meal, going to the theatre all in one weekend, having weekends away, having long, expensive holidays in the sun and then there are other ways of doing things and it can actually turn into a bit of a hobby how can I do things still have those things but do things differently I know people that still have meals out because they are mystery shoppers for example um, I've mentioned already how we did frugal holidays by doing home swapping we had great camping holidays I know the weather in the UK is a bit dodgy sometimes but you know we went into France we drove to France and did camping it's fabulous really enjoyed it kids really loved it we'd had weekends camping so we'd go to a forest in Suffolk absolutely fabulous we saw fireflies we saw deer we saw all sorts of wonderful wildlife um, that we wouldn't have seen if we'd gone to stay in a hotel somewhere we did house swapping you could do house swapping for weekends cheap Airbnbs we did the cheapest of B&B, an old fashioned bed and breakfast in Brighton um, just in lot we were both laughing it was the most it was a, a really old fashioned, cheap £30 a night bed and breakfast on a very fancy street. It was the only house, the only bed and breakfast hotel that hadn't been done up with a very eccentric old guy who ran it. Um, but he did a good breakfast and it was was not luxurious. And we looked at the prices in the kind of really posh B&Bs, upmarket B&Bs opposite, and they were about quadruple what he was charging us. So you know, do things differently. For many years, we went and stayed in a little caravan or small holding in Wales for a holiday. It was something like £100 a week in, and that was in the summer holidays. And that wasn't that long ago. And it was the most beautiful place. I absolutely love North Wales now. And we know it got to know it very well because we went so many times. It must have gone six or seven times. It was just gorgeous. I just loved it until the couple who owned it retired and sold it and then we had to stop going. Otherwise, we'd still be going there. But so there are lots of lots of reasons. I have waffling a bit now, aren't I? But there are lots of reasons to be more frugal. Um, those are the ones I can think of. You may have different reasons to be frugal, but if you just think about what you want, you know, what your goals are for the future and whether that just having a more frugal lifestyle and being a little bit more thrifty, and mindful about your money, whether that can help you achieve those things, then that would motivate you. That would motivate you to get there. So anyway, food for thought. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to give me the thumbs up and subscribe. Hit your notifications bell as well. Okay, I'm off now to walk the dog in the rain. I will see you next time. Bye for now.